And welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk featuring Christina Baker Klein in conversation with Paula McLean to discuss Klein's latest book, The Exiles. I'm Kate Whitman, Vice President of Author Programs and Community Engagement for the History Center. I'm so glad you're joining us this evening. Most of you have already purchased your copy of The Exiles from our official book selling partner, Acapella Books. Those books will be mailed or delivered to you after tonight's event, and additional copies can be purchased from the link in the chat box to the right of your screen. Please submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and um, Christina's editor, Kate, will be joining us a little bit later to um, do the Q&A portion of our program. And now to introduce our authors. Christina Baker Klein is the number one New York Times bestselling author of eight novels, including Orphan Train and A Piece of the World. Christina Baker Klein is published in 40 countries. Her novels have been awarded the New England Prize for Fiction, the Maine Literary Award, and a Barnes and Noble Discover Award, among many other accolades. She's been chosen by hundreds of communities, universities, and schools as one book, one read selections. Born in England and raised in the American South and Maine, she lives in New York City and on Mount Desert Island in Maine. Paul McLean is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Love and Ruin, Circling the Sun, the Paris Wife, and A Ticket to Ride. The memoir-like family growing up in other people's houses is another one of her books. She's also written two collections of poetry. She lives in Ohio with her family, and she is one of my absolute favorites. So I'm so excited that Christina and Paula are joining us tonight. Um, and now, Paula, I will turn it over to you. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you, Kate. It's really nice to see your face and connect with you, and it's really nice to be here with Christina, who's one of my favorite people and authors, and it just feels like this is an opportunity for a love fest. But um, we're here to talk about this gorgeous book, which when it arrived in the mail, I was lucky enough to read it in galleys and to provide an endorsement for the book. But then when it arrived, it just has this luster and it absolutely flows. So congratulations, it's a beautiful book. And I absolutely loved it. Well, I was so privileged and we got such a gorgeous quote from you that we were done. And that was it. We got one blurb and, you know, my editor normally wouldn't allow that, but it was just such a beautiful, perfect <laughs> blurb. And as you know, Paula, you've, it's been everywhere. It's been on every single piece of anything that has. Well, been that's why I did it, Christina. Obviously, it was just really what I could do for me. No, no, no. It's really fun to see you. So we met um, last November when we both were at the Kauai Writers Conference. And in fact, you invited me and I, you know, was very familiar with your work and we knew some of the same people. But it was such a wonderful surprise to just find that you're, I just feel like you're a kindred spirit. And, um, you know, to go, I fell madly in love with not just you, but also your husband and your sister and your sister's husband. And <laughs> I know we were all there. And I, it's hard to believe it was only November because it feels like I've known you forever. And we, I think we just connected on so many levels. And obviously one of them is writing books and just loving to talk about books and think about books. And yeah. that conversation has never ended between us. We just keep, keep going. It's wonderful. Well, one of the ways I feel like we're really kind of simpatico is that we both put a lot of stock in intuition and instinct when it comes to inspiration and finding ideas that kind of, I've heard you call it, and I often think of it as that spidey sense when we have like the feeling of all the hairs on the back of our neck standing up when we know we've hit on an idea that will not you know, sell, but that will take, take us away will carry us away. So tell me how you first found this idea. How did it, how did it capture your yeah. imagination? You know, I didn't always sort of trust that sense, Paula. I don't know if you always did, but when in some, with some of my earlier novels, especially the ones, the first novel I wrote, I, which is called Sweetwater, I had that, I had that tingle, but I didn't know if that was just the way it always was. And then one or two novels right after that, I kind of, um, it was a lot of work to make the idea work. And I liked what I was writing and I believed in it, but I realized at a certain point that I have to feel that way 
I really have, it's not worth spending two or three years on a book if you don't feel completely passionate about it, if you don't go to sleep thinking about it and dream of it and wake up thinking about it when you're working on it, if it's not totally consuming and incredibly kind of um, uh, stimulating to you. I, I, I need to be working on a project that stimulates me all the way through because as you know, it's such a slog to write a book. It's actually hard. And the writing part for me, the research is exciting and the writing sometimes can take off and sometimes it's just a, a slog. It's hard. So you have to have an idea in my view that, you know, that is going to sustain you and even grow bigger than you thought it was at the beginning. And so that's definitely what happened to me with the exiles. Um, and you know, the other thing about writing novels is that you don't always know what your influence, you sort of don't always know, I guess what your influences are, what all the bits and pieces are that led you to a project consciously um, for a long time. And it wasn't until I finished writing the book that I understood that all these different parts of my life had led me to write it. Um, that the, the, the real germ of it, I mean, the, the thing that propelled me, I suppose, is that I read a piece in the New York Times, I read an article about the convict women who went over to Australia from Britain with their children and what it was like for them on the boats. There was a column by Lisa Belkin, who was a, she no longer writes for the Times, or she writes, but doesn't have, uh, she's not an editor there anymore, but she had a column called Motherload, and she wrote about parenting a lot. And I had young children, so I read it that day. And I remember just thinking, this is a phenomenal story that I don't know much about, and I really am interested. And so I immediately sort of went down this rabbit hole of learning more about it. But I now realize that the reason it hit me like that is because I taught in a women's prison, and I'd written a book on feminism with my mother, where we interviewed all these mothers and daughters of the women's movement. And I'd been a Rotary Fellow in Australia in my 20s for six weeks, and I'd been absolutely obsessed with it. I read Robert Hughes's enormous book about Australia at the time, and I loved the book, but there was only one chapter devoted to women and Aboriginal people. I mean, one chapter together in the whole book, 688 pages, and that was the chapter that I was really interested in. So. Years later, when I read this article in the New York Times, I suddenly sort of had all these pieces of my life come together like a puzzle. And I realized this is the story I want to tell. Yeah. I sometimes think we have to, I don't know, it's not like backing into it, but it's almost like all you really need to know is when you have that idea that completely, you know, lights you up, that you're just paying attention in that moment, that it's not random that there's a reason that all these pieces are syncing up in you and inspiring you to, to sort of tell that particular story. I don't know, you can always sort of say, what am I passionate about? You know, almost like a yeah. laundry list. But when it comes along and you have that powerful, you know, response to be paying attention. Paying attention and trusting that, it, that you can, that it will lead you somewhere too. When you, when you have that strong feeling, it's there's a temptation to kind of dismiss it too. Like the story is too big, or in the case of this story, the story is too big. And <laughs> it takes place in a country that I don't live in. And right. it's about I guess people. that's my my next question is like we'd all like to think that we're incredibly brave, but sometimes when those big ideas come along and ask us to jump off a cliff, like, you know, what we really want to do is is run in the other direction because you know what do you know about 19th century Australia and exactly the yeah and it's big I mean at, correct me if I'm wrong you know your last your two previous novels are historical but you've never written a book this epic you've never taken this big a bite it's a really long time ago <laughs> like my other novels um that were set in the I mean well, first of all Orphan Train which was considered historical is only a hundred pages in the past. And that past is not so long ago. I mean, 1929 to 1946, 40, yeah, 48. Um, it's not, it's not, it, it was, it was in the not so 
distant past. I, there are photographs of that time. There are movies, you know, I mean, The Wizard of Oz, like think about all that you could actually see people who lived in that time period on the screen. And then my next novel, A Piece of the World, was um, that same time period. Um, oh yeah, The Piece of the World, yeah, Piece of the World, exactly the same time period actually. So to go back a hundred years um, felt like a giant leap. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the only thing that really, that sort of, I kept in my mind that was really helpful is that when I wrote A Piece of the World, it was about people who lived by choice without electricity, running water, or any modern amenities. So I thought, I've just written a whole book about people who live that way, and that is actually how you had to live in the, in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. So I already had sort of a way of thinking about that in my head, about <clears throat> absolutely where you know what do you do when it gets dark at night where are the candles and how do you deal with say going to an outhouse or whatever it is but you it's just a different uh it's a whole different way of of living and the thing about the 1840s too is you know we had there were horse and buggies there were taxis in london but they were horse drawn you know there were different candles for the rich and the poor there were all these elements of the of the research of the story that were actually fascinating, but I had to immerse myself in order to even begin to understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. It seems to me too that when I was reading The Exiles, that it does kind of share some DNA with Orphan Train a little bit in that you've given voice to the exploited and the disenfranchised, right? Don't, the voice to the voiceless. Um, I also think that the books are both about resilience and about the power of um, friendship and, and the family you find rather than the family you, right, inherit and like how we find true belonging in the world and our tribe and our, our, our place. And, and I wondered if that was, if that's you, you know, I sometimes always think that I only have one book, right? There's only one book in each of us and we just find a way to tell the, our one story in different ways. With okay, well now I really want to hear you talk about that. So I'll sit, I'll talk for a minute, but then I want to hear you talk about it also. Um, I was aware again when I finished this book of of the ways that it's similar to Orphan Train. For example, I have a character named Mathina who is an Aboriginal girl. She really existed, um, but in my book, she's an orphaned. She's she's orphaned and she's eight years old and. In Orphan Train, my central character was nine years old and a, a recent orphan. And in some ways, it was a similar story in that both of them were transported far from home to people that who didn't care about them, didn't know about them. Uh, they were so exiled and displaced from the lives they'd had before that they had no way of connecting to it. They, they had no bearings. You know, they got to this new place and they had to completely reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think I must have drawn on my characterization of that nine-year-old girl as I was writing about this eight-year-old girl in um, Exiles. Also like Orphan Train, um, you know, all of the characters undertake this, this major journey and they have these kind of... Um, Adventures is a nice way of saying it, but they have these trials and tribulations. Yeah, it's an odyssey. There's a series of obstacles and things they have to overcome and um, and survive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Last night I was talking about how this this is the first book that I've actually sort of mapped out on Joseph Campbell's um, you know the heroes the heroes the hero's journey those twelve steps of the hero's journey and if you look at my if you Look at the hero's journey after reading my novel you can see that it does and i had already kind of mapped it out but i realized oh this is actually so much what he's talking about that it was fun Here's the call to adventure you know and yes. here is right and if you don't if all of you who are tuning in don't know joseph campbell, campbell it's easy to find online if you just google joseph campbell the hero's journey because if you you'll see the sort of elements of um you know, of a, um, of a real adventure epic. And in my novel, that story is broken into several different people's stories. So it's not one 
character who has the journey, they sort of undertake it together. And in fact, I envision the novel as a passing of the baton from one female convict to the next, and, and then eventually to the next generation. Um, and in passing that baton, you also pass on philosophies, literature. So like the Tempest is beloved by one person and she sort of passes on that knowledge to the next and then the next. And uh, there are literal things that you pass on like a handkerchief and a um, and a, a, a necklace. And um, so that was really fun to think about too. Like how, how do I have this story told by several different people in a way that is chronological? They're not going back and forth really. I mean, except right. Mathena threads through, but these convict women, one passes it to the next. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a minute about character because it seems to me that regardless of how fascinating any moment in history is or any sort of story we know a little bit about but want to know more about or what about these convict women or what about Van Diemen's land or to me like the power of a story really and, and whether or not it succeeds has everything to do with are the characters do we root for them? Do we identify with them? Are they, is there a level of um, recognition and intimacy? And so talk about that. So here you have this idea, early Australia, but then you still have to find these characters. So talk a little bit about yeah. that process of discovery. And of course it's different because Mathina is based on a real woman, but Hazel and Evangeline are, are products of your imagination. So talk just a little bit about how yeah covered them and how they become the vehicles for this story to illuminate the things that you're interested in. So I, so I read that article, then I started reading lots of things and eventually I came up with this story. And just to step back, I'll, the sentence I always use, which is, uh, which is just sort of general, is that my novel is about the convict women who transformed Australia and the Aboriginal people whose way of life was destroyed when colonists landed on their shores. So that was, that was what I started with as an idea. I mean, what I really started with was the convict women. And I'll, I, I can talk a bit later about how um, Mathena came into the story. But I, I, I always knew, well, so I, lived, I, I was born in England and lived there for nine years off and on. And, read a lot of English literature. I was uh, an English major in college. And then I, I, had a ma I went back to Cambridge and did a master's in English literature, read you know, all this 19th century literature. And the idea of a governess who had been um, raised by her impoverished, but very educated, highly educated vicar father who taught her um, friend, Greek and French and Latin and really took her seriously as an intellect, but taught her no practical skills um, was really appealing to me. So I, I, I had this character in mind and then the vicar dies and she has to make her way in the world and the way, really one of the only ways that educated but poor women had to make their way in the world at the time was to teach, to be a governess, to go live with a family. It was very common. And so she does that. And so she moves to London where, you know, she's completely unsophisticated from a small town called Tunbridge Wells, uh, which is outside of London. And, and she moves into this household with very sophisticated, jaded people. And she meets the very handsome son, older son of the household and um, ends up finding herself pregnant. This is right at the very beginning of the book. And the family, needless to say, is not pleased. And essentially, she's falsely accused of stealing a ring. And that sets in motion the whole story. And as I was creating her character, I had so much fun because, you know, I'm, I'm working with this really educated woman who, um, who, is, who's, who reads poetry. So there's a lot of poetry in the beginning. But, but she, her fatal flaw is that she is so naive that she doesn't understand quite what's happening to her. And so what I loved about writing from her perspective is that as the reader is going deeper into this morass of sort of, she's tumbled off the social ladder and 
finds herself in a stagecoach on the way to Newgate Prison and then is sentenced to the land beyond the seas, as the British courts called Australia, and finds herself in a repurposed slaving ship on her way <clears throat> for this four month journey to, to, the, to this island, Tasmania, off the coast of Australia that is part of Australia. So, so she is shocked by everything. She, it's all new to her. She's, she's never seen anything like it. So it was a good way for me to sort of bring the reader in because my other convict characters are more typical of the convicts at the time, which is that they've always been down there in the muck. You know, they were on the bottom rugs of the social ladder. They're not surprised by any of it. They figured out how to navigate it. They're pretty canny and savvy. Yeah. And so, you know, and so when you get to them and you learn what it takes to survive in that kind of world, it's a different experience than coming into it in the first place with this character. I think it's a, a really rich point of view. And I always think of, that outsider's perspective gives you, I know, gives you an opportunity, right? And yeah, I think it's interesting that Evangeline is so she's if her fatal flaw is that she's overly trusting, it's also a it's also a virtue, right? It's something that we admire, or she it basically it breaks our heart, right? That she's so trusting and naive, and then when she meets up with Hazel, who who is another sort of character that then picks up the baton and carries it forward, um, is she's cynical, like she's, she's jaded, she's been wounded by the world, and um, it's difficult for her to let anybody get close to her. But then these two women forge a connection, and the way that they're linked on this ship, right, uh, has long-lasting consequences. Right. Yeah, I mean, that kind of trust that neither of them actually had really had in the past was really fun to build. Um, and I mean, look, we were just talking about our own friendship. I, we know the power of, of friendship and a female friendship. And I was especially, I think I especially drew on my experience teaching in this women's prison, where um, I was teaching in maximum security, um, women, a number of them, most all of them were there for a while, you know, and there were lifers there too. And, um, and I thought as I went into it that it was going to be really de depressing. I mean, it was in many ways, of course, hard and difficult and hard on these women. But what I also discovered is that we make a life wherever we are. Mm -hmm. And so even in that setting, their women formed incredibly strong bonds of friendship and even love, of course. And not only that, but they had ingenious ways of doing things. They figured out how to make gourmet meals out of the commissary food and um, exchange recipes. And they, um, they wrote poetry and songs and sewed and did, you know, did a lot of things to keep themselves sort of, to keep their spirits up and to keep them connected to each other. And I, I thought, the Cascades Prison, which I describe in the novel, which is a really tough place. You go into it um, off the boat, um, you walk four miles, um, you know, through this town and passing all these people who are watching you, and then you end up in this sort of dank prison. Um, but even there, there were ways that people found connection and solace. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show that as well. Otherwise, you know, the story itself could be quite relentless if you don't have those kinds of connections. Right. It seems to me that the book is very much an odyssey and each sort of stage needs to be endured. First Newgate Prison, which really came alive. I just, hats off to you and your level of research. I also love that you didn't hurry through that bit, even though we knew that we were ultimately going to get on a ship and head off um, to the other side of the world, like we knew we were headed in that direction, you really take your time and you let that world build because each piece of it really matters, I think, in terms of, you know, um, the, the arc of the story and, and, and what you're trying to do in a, in a larger way for the book. You're building these themes and these connections slowly. I think you have a lot of, it seems to me, patience. I mean that as a compliment as a writer, that you sort of let these things fl flower, I guess, or build, you know, build energy as they move forward. I was fascinated by Newgate Prison. Then I was also fascinated by the world of the ship, how they 
sort of survive some of these horrible, um, uh, you know, not the seasickness and then uh, how they, how they live that way and sort of what, what that as a world is like and how you survive that. And it was fascinating to me too, that Hazel as a character, you know, if Evangeline has Shakespeare and sort of the world of the mind, then she has this other knowledge, these levels of lore and wisdom. And she knows all these medicinal uses of plants and how to keep, other women yeah, that was a really fun that was a really fun thing to build was the character of hazel because i see her as sort of a superhero in that she has what what was a very in demand power superpower essentially which is that she could heal people and she knew how to use herbs and flowers to do that and a lot of people needed that and didn't know how to do it so that meant that she had she had power and could barter um, and she sort of was able to pull herself forward that way and i loved that idea of the scrappy character having those skills mm -hmm. um, so my <laughs> my sister was telling me about this trashy reality show called below decks mediterranean <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen it so i watched it last night the first episode and actually i was struck by um, the kind of upstairs downstairs quality of that show and how it is also what happens in my novel um, that on the ship, you know, there are these hierarchies and there are these worlds of different classes of people. And it's, um, it's as true of the below decks reality show as it is of, of my novel. And I actually find all of that so fascinating. I love, I love kind of examining class and, um, where people operate within it and how people operate differently when they tumble down or tumble upward too. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's funny. Let's talk for a minute about Mathina um, because here's this character who really lived and it seems to me, or, or at least I feel this way, that when I take up someone else's story, that this is a person who actually lived, I have a certain amount of responsibility when I pick up that person's story. And I also want to keep myself honest. I wanna believe as I'm writing the book that the decisions that I'm making and the reason I'm telling this person's story is out of love, you know? And because I believe I was inspired by this story and I wanted to do it justice in the book. So talk a little bit about that, about um, why you made the decision to tell Lepina's story and then sort of what that felt like, sort of carrying her torch. Yeah, um, thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk about this because it is such a complicated question at the moment. Um, but the question of whether people who are not of a certain background, of the same background, have a right to even address a story um, of, of someone of a different culture, race. Um, so as I mentioned, the novel began with this idea of the convict women. I read this um, article about them, and then I read books about them. And as I began to do more research, it took a while actually, because there are plenty of books and articles about the convict women that don't directly touch on the story of what was happening to the Aboriginal people. But when I went to Tasmania and I went to the museum there, which was, the, it was a new exhibit actually, the Tasmanian Aboriginal exhibit was only a few months old when I got there. But I realized it was exactly the same time period in uh, the early 1840s when there was all this um, turmoil. And most Aboriginal people had been exiled from Tasmania to this little island called Flinders. It was essentially an open air concentration camp really. Um, and people died in great numbers. But this one girl was taken by the governor of Tasmania and his wife, Sir John Franklin and Lady Jane Franklin. And John Franklin, by the way, became an Arctic explorer who was, who was very famous and disappeared with his entire crew in the Arctic some years later. Um, they took her in as a kind of social experiment. She was orphaned and they wanted to see if they could, quote, turn her into a lady, um, dressing her in English clothing and teaching her French and um, educating her with a, an English teacher and, um, you know, all those things, teaching her dances. And 
what I describe in the book is what actually happened to this girl. Um, in my novel, she, she's eight when the story begins. In real life, she was five when she was taken by them. But I made her eight because I wanted her consciousness to be a little bit old, a little more developed, a little bit older. Um, I felt it would be irresponsible to tell the story of the convict women without grappling with what happened to the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and, and actually Australian Tas uh, Aboriginal people as a whole. Um, it felt wrong. And even though I knew it was risky and scary to, to tell a story of someone from a different culture, I knew I had to do it. So the way I did it is that I just did a ton of research I interviewed lots of people. I read lots of books. I, I, if you go to my website, there's a whole section on all the, all the kind of background to the story. Um, I worked with a Tasmanian Aboriginal professor who is himself de descended from a tribe in Tasmania, and he was really helpful. He's, he's sort of the world expert, um, consults with museums and with other writers and novelists and nonfiction writers. Um, that was very helpful. I also had what are called sensitivity readers. I had people read it. Um, I had lots of people read it um, to sort of make sure that I was getting the facts right. And not only the facts, but the tone, getting the tone right. Um, I wrote it in the third person limited. So it is from her perspective, but it's a step removed from first person, which felt more comfortable to me and it felt more right. And then the final thing I guess I would say about it is just that, um, I approached Mathena's story and I, as the same way I approached the convict women's story in that who they are inside uh, had, had little to do with how they were perceived by people. So the idea I was working with is that other, otherness is imposed from outside. So you see through Mathena's eyes the way people respond to her and what they say about her. And I was quoting Lady Jane and Sir John, you know, things they said about her. Uh, it's all in the public record. You know, you can read that much of what I said in the books people had said. Um, but at the same time, she had a very rich and full inner life and very strong feelings of her own and thoughts. And I wanted to show that. So, you know, Lynn manuel a few months ago when, when Hamilton came out as a movie, um, on Twitter, people, some people sort of said, you didn't go far enough. You know, you may have cast people of color, but you didn't actually grapple with slavery um, adequately. And how do you respond to that? And he said, um, this is a huge story. I did the best I could do. And there are many more stories to be told. And there are many other ways to do this and other people will do that and thank goodness because I'm certainly not the authority. I only did what I could uh, with the story that I had. And, and so that's sort of, I think that's a good answer. I think that's yeah. how I feel about it, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something I really like about writing historical fiction and, and reading is I always feel like I'm learning something new, but then there's this other thing that happens, at least for me, like when I'm deeply steeped in the research and just doing this, this powerful dive into the consciousness of a character, I sometimes feel like I'm being, I'm being hijacked by the world of the story. Like I, I really did fly across the Atlantic in 1936, or I, I really could have, or, you know, um, trained racehorses in Africa or yeah. gone, gone to war um, with Hemingway or, or whatever. And I don't know it's, it's amazing. And I was always that kind of reader too, like completely ready at the drop of a hat to be swept away by a story. And I just wonder if this is something that happens to you as well. I mean, do you, do you let yourself, do you invite that as an experience being taken over? I think you have to, to really sort of be in, in the bones of, a, of your characters. And at a certain point in the writing process, I feel like I, have kind of been taken over. I'm not fit for human company. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I go around in a fog. When I was finishing 
God, what novel? I think I was finishing Peace of the World or I was in the middle of it. I just went over the bars of my bike and broke my shoulder. I was so absent-minded. I was working on it all the time. I mean, I am afraid to sometimes walk around in public. I, it's funny. And my, you know, my son, Eli would come home from school. He was a senior when I was working on that book and he would be like, you're still sitting in the same place that I left you. I don't understand. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there is a way that you just have to live the story and it's very, it's just, it won't let you go. I find that amazing uh, it's, as an experience and also so hard. I mean, to think about starting a new novel or writing a new novel and have, and, and getting to that level of immersion, it's hard to, it's hard to, um, make yourself do it. It's like, I mean, I guess people climb Everest and Mount Kilimanjaro and choose to do that, those things over and over again. That's what it feels like though, to me, like I'm looking up at a mountain when I start a book and you just have to, you know, it's what Anne Lamott said to mix metaphors, but she, Anne Lamott famously has this amazing guide to writing. And she says, bird by bird, bird by bird, a bird by bird. And um, the anecdote is that her brother was working on a project for school when they were little, and he was totally flummoxed by it. It was a project about birds of America. And his father came over and said, just take it bird by bird, buddy, bird <laughs> by bird. <laughs> and I love that idea, too, because you do have to just sort of break it down and take it, you know, bit by bit. But anyway, yes, Paula, do you mind answering that question, too? I would love to know. Um, you know, um, what that is like for you. What that is like for me. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> I think it's my favorite thing. And I'm, I think it's the way that I reconnect or connect with some primal part of myself. I'm still the girl, like hiding between the stacks in the library, like reading a biography of Annie Oakley and, and feeling like I, I am that, you know, that the that piece of history wants to invite me forward to connect with it. I'm that kind of reader and I feel like I'm that kind of writer when things are going well and when it's, they're not going well, it almost feels like being kicked out of heaven, you know, like you're <laughs> sort of like rattling the bars, let me in, like, let me in. And, and I don't know, sometimes we just have to lose ourselves completely in order to find ourselves, right? To lose well, our centers and to be overwhelmed it has to be that big. It's like eating an elephant, right? It's too big and I couldn't possibly do it justice. And that's a good way to teach myself humility and just say, well, I'm, I'm going in. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things, well, I, so I just read your new book that nobody else gets to read for so long. I'm so privileged um, coming out in April, but I was struck by it in your new book, but as well as in, of course, in your other books, but how you write about the natural world. And um, I know that you studied as a poet um, and I did too. I, uh, in college, I studied poetry. That was really what I did. And, um, and I think to this day, thank God that, that I read a lot of poetry. I studied a lot of poetry because it does inform the way I write. Um, and, and, and the way I look at the world and the way I, describe a sunset or, um, you know, a, a scene from nature, but I was really struck by it reading your book, how poetic it is. Yeah. You know, were you aware, are you aware of that as you write? Thank you. So I think I said it earlier too, maybe we only each have one story to tell. We only have our own point of view. And when I was a kid, the natural world saved me. It was the place I could go when the grown-up world was too chaotic or difficult or violent or or what have you and to disappear in that just like it i disappeared into the world of books and describe for some reason i don't know why describing nature is incredibly grounding to me i find it peaceful and i'm always looking when i'm in the mind of a character and through their eyes i'm always looking for those landmarks i'm looking for the moon you know, I'm looking for the shade of the sky. I'm, you know, that it, it helps me get my bearings. It's, it's sort of my, my compass rose. You know? That was one of the things I found 
um, about going to Australia and twice to do research is that um, the, the, the sort of observations I made there about what the sky looked like and the orange lichen on the rocks and the things that you wouldn't, the things that I couldn't have gotten from say Wikipedia or the internet or even a guidebook. Um, <laughs> Earth. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Like um, one evening, Cynthia, my sister that you, who you know, Paula, um, we were staying in this little echo farmhouse, this very sweet little um, new, new farmhouse. And we were in, it was set in a field and <clears throat> we realized that at dusk every evening, hundreds of wallabies would gather on the hillside right in front of us. And they were, it was always at the same time of evening. And who would have ever known that uh, if you weren't there? I've never heard about that before. So I put it in the book, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, but it seems to me that those are the gifts of the book and then it's in there. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't put it in the book so that there's a level of texture and veracity, you put it in the book because it belongs in the book because it happened to you when you were living the world of the book. Exactly, yeah. That's a really good way to put it. I love that. I love that idea. Thank you. And I think it's time to open this up <laughs> to the audience, even though we could probably sit and talk to each other forever. But yeah, let's open it up no. to questions. Um, well, just for me, what a great conversation that was. And what a pleasure to hear the two of you talking. I could have listened for another three hours. Uh, <laughs> but we do have questions in the chat and I want to make sure we get to them. Okay. This is my editor, Catherine Ninzel, by the way, um, and we, I've been privileged to work with her for four books, Kate? Four books, five. Five books, and we have Starting with a more coming up. <laughs> and we have two more coming up. The longest relationship of my publishing career. I, that is amazing. That's amazing. I got Kate when she was a whippersnapper. So I feel very, we, we grew up together. I was already a little more grown up. but we kind of <laughs> well, It's been a really great journey and through trains and ships and yes, we've had a lot of ways of journeying. It's true. A lot of ways of journeying. Um, okay. I want to jump into some of the questions here. So first Robin says, I would love to hear more building on Paula's question about how Christina builds her characters getting down to the nuts and bolts level. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, one thing I talked about last night that I've never done before, but Kate, I, I remember calling you in great excitement with this idea and you were a little like, um, <laughs> I <laughs> had read this feminist article about the concept of the final girl in slasher movies. Do you remember what I called you about that? Yeah. I was like, this is crazy. Um, I'll building regular characters I'll talk about in a second, but I will say that um, there's a, a moment in the story where um, something, it, everything comes to a sort of head and one of the characters has to absolutely figure things out um, in a split second. And there's this concept of, um, uh, of a specific kind of girl and there are rules to this genre um, about what hap who she is and then how she gets out of peril and why she's the final girl, why she's sort of the survivor. And that trope was really interesting to me to explore. And I loved, I loved exploring it and working with it because it has rules like, um, like the girl sort of becomes masculine at the end and the male figure becomes feminine and they sort of switch places in that way. Um, and to the extent that she even actually dresses like a boy. And I, so I had that in the book. I mean, there were these little things that nobody would ever know if they hadn't known it. But when I was talking about the hero's journey uh, and then now talking about this final girl idea, there are ways in which structure inherent from some people naturally are very good at plot and structure. I am not so good at that naturally. I, I think I could just write about characters all the live long day and develop them, live with them, breathe with them. 
And so it's helpful for me to look at models of um, plot and theme, uh, not theme, because I've got theme down pretty well, but, um, but plot really, and how a story unfolds and where the high and low points come. And, you know, these, the, the, the major plots in literature have been around for thousands and thousands of years. So um, once I knew that I had the sprawling story about Australia, um, I, as I mentioned earlier with Paula, I, I quickly had some characters that I really liked. And the thing I love about um, the characters in the exiles is that they're very different from each other. Um, Evangeline has really nothing in common with Hazel. Neither of them have anything in common with Mathena. So writing them was, was super fun because there was never any question. You know, sometimes you write characters who are best friends or whatever, and they have a lot of similarities and you're trying to figure out how to differentiate them. I never had that problem in this, this book. Um, and the other thing is that all three of my characters, and this is a, for anybody, for any writers in the audience, this is, this is um, a sort of key question of characterization, which is what does your character want? What do they quest after? You know, what do they need that they can't find? And in a story like this, those questions are fairly elemental and simple in a way, because there's a literal level of what they need and can't find, which is freedom for all three of them in a way. Um, and then there is um, a more metaphorical level or philosophical level um, about identity and meaning. How do you find meaning when you're, um, you know, when you've been wrongfully convicted and sent halfway across the world to a place that you'll never leave. You, you, you know, the women who got on those ships did not return to England. They were, and, and so even if you had say a seven year sentence, which was the l shortest amount of years you could go, it was a life sentence because you wouldn't be going back. So, so those questions of longing and, um, and identity, those, that was how I built character, was thinking about, trying to think deeply about what each of those characters would want. And again, they were different for each one. So that made, that made it um, easier, I think. And then that ties into another question we have, which is also about sort of the novel construction as a whole, which is um, even in a narrower span of time and place, I think one of the greatest challenges would be to keep the story contained, such a big story, do you have trouble wrestling your material into a manageable scale? And do you have to do extensive excisions, cutting out whole tangents? Oh my God, I think you should answer that, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say there's not extensive excisions. No, it's no, the opposite. Exactly. It's actually the opposite. I mean, it always has been with us that like, I actually kind of write short and then you are like, wait a minute. We need a lot more here, except I do do one, I have one tick that Kate has pointed out over and over again that's so, that you actually um, touched on, Paula, which is that I kind of write a long way to get into my story, and Kate's like, okay, we're cutting the first 20 pages, and then the story begins. I always a lot at the beginning, and then we kind of need to add to the end. But with the I was, what I remember is a lot of what we did was, Paul, you mentioned that Newgate, that all the pieces in Newgate, and what we did, Christina, is some of the, it yeah. obviously couldn't be the Newgate stuff because that was specific to Newgate, but some of the thoughts or the processes or the themes that were in Newgate, we moved them back to either the ship or to the Cascades because there was so much imprisonment. <laughs> yeah, we needed to sort of spread it out a little. I know. I'm actually so glad you're here, Kate, because we I've never... It, I've done what six of these or whatever. I, I haven't talked about this, but you, your role is so important because I come in with all this material. And and see, the, I, the thing is, I think because I did write the novel chronologically, I was so fascinated with the Newgate material and with how it felt to be incarcerated there and this shock of this experience that I I um, I really did dive deep into Newgate. And it's still a lot because I, I wanted to show that the friendships develop there and et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but you were really great at saying like, all of this can actually come on the ship and we want to get to the ship. You're like, we need to get to the ship. Yeah. 
And so you really did help speed that up. And I'm sure for readers, you'll be like, wait a minute, but there is a, still a lot of Newgate. And there is, but there was more before. There was more. There was more. But thematically, it kind of could be spread out a bit. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, remember, at the beginning, I started actually chronologically, meaning I started with Evangeline in the village, and then she gets to that. And you were like, let's start at the house and just go back to the... I forgot about that. Yeah, about that. So that was really helpful. Um, here's another question about scale, and I think probably you and Paula both have something to say about this. How do you research efficiently? So in Christina's case, like with all of Australian history to delve into, how do you know that you've learned enough for to start to stop researching and start writing? And I think my another question I have coming out of those for both of you when you're writing about a real person how do you decide where the story begins and how the story ends like how do you create that arc that is such a hard question okay shall I let Paula take this one first and then I'll do sure well my process is I don't recommend it because it's not <laughs> efficient and it's 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 not efficient but and it doesn't even make sense but I, I'm not a writer who, who makes sense. I don't feel like I'm a rational writer. I'm an emotional writer and an intuitive writer. And so what happens with me is the minute I get that, the spidey sense, I feel like I'm being hijacked by the engine of the story, a voice or a world or a, a something, right? The thing, the magic, the, the secret sauce. Um, I just start writing blindly over the cliff, like the fool in the, on the tarot deck, right? Like over the cliff. And then I need to catch up to myself with the research. So I'll get to a moment. It's like, what is it like to learn to fly a plane at altitude in Africa in 1929? You know, or what was it like to um, go, then what was happening in Madrid in, you know, the spring of 1937 when Franco's army surrounded it on three sides? Like, then I, then I catch up with the research to fill in the blanks, but the, the character and the voice is, for me, the main thing. Once I have that, then I can fill in and, and learn what I need to learn as I go. But have you done research, you've done research in advance to like learn about Hadley or Martha Gellhorn. I mean, you've learned something yes. about- Yes, I always, yes. I mean, I'm always doing the whatever, there's the research that you need to, to be able to start telling the story. But honestly, when I have an idea, I start writing that day. I start writing before I know what I'm writing. That's really cool. And then what about Kate's question about- Wait, 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 you didn't answer the question. No, I know, but we have a two-parter. <laughs> um, <laughs> what about Kate's question about writing about real people? Like how do you then frame a story? Do you think consciously about it or do you just dive in and wherever you start, you start? Well, with The Paris Wife, it was really easy because I was writing about a marriage, you know? I was writing about Hemingway's first marriage. And so for me, the story began when they met and it ended when they ended. And that seemed to make sense with this latest novel called Love and Ruin about uh, another Hemingway novel, even though I did not mean to write another one, um, which is really about Martha Gellhorn initially when I was drafting, I just wanted to get right to war. I wanted to get right to Australia. Forget about Newgate. I wanted to, I wanted to be in Madrid in the spring of 1937, you know. Um, and yet, a part of it was my editor at Ballantyne, Susanna Porter, you know, asking me to stop and go backwards. Like, I write short too, and I need to be encouraged to develop. And it occurred to me, um, once Susanna pointed it out, is like we really needed to know not just how she met Hemingway, but how she became the kind of girl who would throw herself at a war, who would walk across the border from France into Spain on foot in the middle of the night with 50 bucks rolled up and tucked in her boot. You don't, you don't, you're, you don't, you become that person. It's not overnight. Right. And so you have to sort of go backward enough to establish those threads, you know? Yeah. Christina, yeah. I want to give you an opportunity to answer that, but this ties in so nicely to another part. Another okay, good. Part yeah, part yeah, part yeah. Two, um, which is, have you ever had the experience where you intended the scene or storyline to go in one direction and your character surprised you and sent it in a different direction? And I would add to that, if you're writing and researching, do you ever get into conflict there also? 
Oh yeah. I mean, now I'm overwhelmed by all three questions because they're so, they're all three so interesting and important. Um, in a funny way, so I was just thinking about what Paula said about jumping straight in and writing. I don't really do that. I, you know, my father is a historian and I grew up with him writing all these books for university presses. He had one big um, commercial book uh, that was about Jesse Owens with Macmillan and it became a movie or TV series and he was a consultant. It was very, um, it was very um, surprising and glamorous to us because he was, we were used to his books, you know, coming in little boxes and uh, just part of his kind of life career. Um, but generally speaking, he was a professor and he wrote these his history books. And when I started writing novels, it didn't occur to me that I had anything in common with him. I really thought that, that what we did was completely separate from each other. And uh, my dad didn't, uh, to my knowledge at the time, read many novels either. I, you know, and so it, but the more that my career has progressed, the more I realize that I'm really similar to him and I research in a similar way. So I get, I get the spidey sense, I get the spidey sense and I get the story idea. And then I just want to dive into the research. And it's so fun for me that in some ways it's hard to stop. Um, I start reading everything. I'm, I'm taking all these notes. I've got different documents. I was telling my Kate, my editor, Kate, today that I found the epigraph for my next book. And it's so exciting. I have an ideas and inspiration for that book file that is really fun to percolate. Um, and then just the, because yet again, I'm writing a book set in the past, um, you know, it does require a lot of research. And so it's so fun to discover another time period and work on it. Um, I have to kind of make myself then start writing while I'm still researching, because there's no question that even once you started writing, in my case at least, the research is not done. Like you have to know the kind of bustle that someone had on a skirt, or um, as I said earlier, the kind of tallow that they used for candles or whatever. There are details that come up, the kind of state, what does a stagecoach look like that's a taxi in London in the 1840s? So, um, so I, I, I do what you do, Paula, which is I write fast. Um, I write my first draft and I try to capture that inspiration, that lightning in a bottle. Um, and then there's a ton of editing to be done, many drafts. But, um, but yeah, once I start writing, I really um, try to keep going. And then, and the research that I, and sometimes I'll just say like TK to come, you know, to a, that old journalist, term, um, which just means I'll fill this in, this bit that I don't know yet, um, if it's if the writing's going really well and I need to keep it going. Uh, what else was it? Uh, Condensing into the arc. How do you know, how do you take this big story and then shrink it down? Um, it really is back to the bird by bird thing of, for me, of the granular details of life. So I was so frightened by the scope of the, of the book and that I, well, Kate, one of the things that happens, and I don't know if you've noticed this over with each book, it seems, I have a quite ambitious timeline that gets smaller and smaller. So actually this book only takes place over four years. I had originally thought it would be like 25 years. Um, and then there's a, co there's a very, to me, very satisfying, my only, the, the only novel I've ever written that has like a super satisfying ending because it really does tell you kind of later what happened to people. Um, I've never done that before and I had such a fun time writing it. I was like, wow, I get to actually end this story. Um, but, but so I, I think shrinking the timeline, I realize as I go that I'm, I'm just very caught up in the details of the story and then in that way, I avoid the big picture of kind of worrying about the epic quality of it. Because when you when you read books like that are unsuccessful, books that uh, that are too big, too general. Um, you really, you, I want to feel what someone is thinking, breathing, living. You know how their heart is beating. I want to know what people are feeling in a story. It's and and so sticking with the human is is. The, the goal, I guess. Great. Um, I'm going to jump onto one. I have one more question, and I, and I think we're probably running yeah. out of time. Um, 
The Exiles is such a visual book. The imagery of each character's journey from the smells to the environment around them gives the reader a special, seemingly cinematic experience of the 19th century. Can you speak to the relationship between this book and the potential TV series, series that is in the works? Um, my sister today suggested that Paul Mescal, who plays um, the love interest in Sally Rooney's miniseries, should be the what the what the TV people call, um, you know, the sexy doctor in my book. <laughs> I didn't, I've never, I didn't write the book thinking of it in that way at all. But, um, but now that it's been optioned, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Oh, and one of the things, actually, I was going to say this earlier, but one of the things I did when I was writing it is I, before I wrote it, I hammered out this 50 page single spaced document that was kind of all the research of that exact period, but then also the story with all these other characters who don't appear in the book, who ended up not making it in. So I actually have this bigger landscape of the novel that is, um, was quite delightful for them to receive because it had all these other characters and um, storylines and things. And so there's a lot to be said that hasn't been said in this novel. And the novel's my biggest, my longest novel, as you know, um, but I still, there's still plenty more to be explored. And it's going to be uh, even more epic. What's that? Even more epic. Yeah, even more epic. And, and to have a series that's <clears throat> unfolding over a number of hours, I think it's the perfect way to handle it because there's just so much richness and so much in it. And I'm um, executive producing it, which is so exciting because I get to put my fingers in it a little bit. So we'll see what happens, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think as are we all, as am I, it'll be my first adaptation anyway. <laughs> um, no, 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 John Searles. John well, Searles, yes, John Searles, you're right, he does, his movie, yep. Um, the way is now on Netflix. Yes, Strange But True, available yeah. on Netflix, like just now, there's yeah. our, there's our shill for John. Everyone should go watch it. <laughs> uh, okay, it's eight o'clock. I want to give you guys, Paula, thank you for being in conversation. Christina, that thank you. Good. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to just sign out and say goodbye. And I think I'm going to exit my own face off the screen now, if that's all right. Thank you, Kate. All right. Bye. Bye. Paula. We're still here. <laughs> still here. We're ready to go. Yeah, it was just really such a pleasure to talk to you. And Thank you so much for doing this. I know, I mean, writers are, I know how busy you are and how much you have going on. And um, it, you know, it's a lot to, well, first of all, you read my book before, so thank you for that. Um, and second, just thank you for being here and asking such wonderful questions. Yeah, um, um, it's fun. It's fun to root for you from here, from my living room to yours. So um, congratulations on the book. I think it's beautiful and I think you're beautiful. And um, yeah, I hope the world stops ending so I can see you soon. I hope so too. Yeah. Um, all right, love to you. Thank you, everyone. And right. thank you, Kate Whitman. Thank you, Atlanta History Center. Yes. Good night. Bye-bye.